There is a peacefulness to the sound of a kalimba that's hard to beat. But playing it is a different story. With patience thin as a needle and thumbs thick as bratwurst, it's an impossible task. But instead of throwing it away, I did the second most sensible thing. I made it electric. But first off, what is a kalimba? The kalimba is kind of a thumb piano. It has roots in Africa, but has captivated audiences around the world with its smooth, ethereal sound. They come in many shapes and sizes, and usually feature either a resonance plate or a resonance box to help boost and enhance the sound. The things that are played are called tines. For the purpose of this project, I will be going with an 8 tine kalimba, which allows for a compact design. All the sounds you will hear coming from the kalimba are completely unprocessed and recorded on the same mic, so that you will be able to hear how it changes throughout this project. And I think it's appropriate that we take it back to where it all begins, at the making of the sound itself. There are actually quite a few ways to play the kalimba. You could hear it, tap it, pluck it, or boat like a violin. So I decided to test a few of them out. First, I tried hitting it. Then I attached a spring, hoping it would create a better sound by bouncing back quickly. But this was tricky to manage and often led to repeated strikes. Hitting the tine created two distinct sounds. The vibration and the impact. To reduce the impact noise, I tried adding tape. This just made the sound overall quieter, highlighting how little vibration was happening. Plucking gave a clearer and louder sound. So that's the route I took. This decision opened the door to the next design challenge. Designing a system to move the pluck between the tines. So I started sketching on a few ideas, while also setting up some overall design goals. The tines misalignment and height variations made finding a solution for moving the pluck harder. Several ideas crossed my mind, but they all felt overly complex, and complexity often risks compromising reliability. But as I weighted these options, I kept thinking to myself how nice it would have been if the tines were just aligned, until I realized that they can be. So I rearranged the tines from shortest to longest, essentially eliminating the problem at its root. Turns out, I had been searching for a solution when I should have been looking at the problem. Next, I started designing the mechanism to move the plug between the tines. I tested a method inspired by 3D printers, with wheels that fit into V-shaped slots on a profile. The wheels are pre-tensioned against the profile and help keep the movement smooth and accurate. But I also made a second version, which just slides along two rods. I found that the first version was more robust, thanks to the pre-tensioned wheels. But the simplicity and low friction of the sliding version convinced me, and I ended up going with this approach. So I jumped into CAD and started sketching on a prototype. So I tested it out, and what I saw wasn't exactly what I pictured. The violent shaking is definitely not intended. I think the server is getting caught in a feedback loop, and one cause of this might be the hole size against the rods. Because when the holes are too big, the carriage can tilt and become self-locking. This became apparent when I tried twisting and pushing it down the rods. I addressed the issue by printing wider sliders that fit more snugly around the rods, which limits how much the carriage can tilt. And even though this made a big difference, some signs of self-locking remained, so I kept looking for ways to improve it. And eventually, I came across a YouTube comment with a really interesting idea. The idea was to print the holes slightly undersized and then press them onto the rods. By then heating the rods with a lighter, I could slide the plastic part back and forth and melt it to a perfect fit. This approach worked well, providing minimal play while still allowing for smooth sliding. And the self-locking was as good as gone. But just as I thought I found the perfect solution, 
I came across these PTFE line slider bushings, which seemed like a more durable approach. So I decided to go with these, although the melting method would probably have sufficed. Finally, I downsized everything and ended up with a setup that I was quite happy with. With the plucking mechanism finally sorted out, the next task was to figure out how to attach the Kalimba to the machine, but I noticed a few characteristics that I needed to consider. It seems like most of the sound is actually coming from the back of the Kalimba, and not the front. To verify this, I wanted to record the sounds coming from both sides to see how they compare. The result showed that the sound coming from the back was in fact stronger than the sound from the front, but it's hard to tell how reliable these results are. The second thing I noticed about the kalimba is that you shouldn't grip it too hard, because it really dampens the sound. So with these priorities in mind, I designed the holder with cushion clamps to suspend the kalimba in midair, leaving plenty of open space surrounding it. The new holder did its job quite decently, and preserved much of the sound sustain. But the sound quality is still far from impressive. It's dull and drained out by servo noise. It doesn't play my favor that the kalimba is lacking a resonance box, and the resonance plate is, well, quite underwhelming. Just compare it to what happens if I put it on a table, essentially turning the entire table into a resonance plate. The problem is that this table is very heavy, so I won't go for this solution. While the open back probably helped to increase the overall loudness, much of the sound coming from the back might not reach the listener, making them less effective. Here, I saw an opportunity to redirect these sound waves towards the front, and the first thing that popped into my mind was one of those sound cones that you can see on an old gramophone, and I wanted to give this a try. When I played the kalimba with the sound cone, there was minimal to no improvement. I initially thought that this might have to do something with the shape of the cone being off and causing sound waves to be trapped inside the cone. So after a bit of research about different sound cone design principles, I printed out a new version with a more conventional shape and a straighter profile. But the increase in volume was still minimal. likely because the cone's output wasn't large enough compared to its input. From what I read, the output should be significantly larger. Even then, I wasn't sure it would result in the sound amplification that I was aiming for. So I decided to drop this ID. Which was unfortunate since I thought the cone added a nice touch to the overall look. Instead, I started experimenting with the resonance box. And the improvement was quite clear. Which was maybe not a huge surprise. There's probably a good reason for why they all look like this. So I thought, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And designed a holder incorporating a resonance box. But when I listened to it more closely, I heard some unwanted sounds and odd noises, like there were different sounds interfering with each other. It seems like the walls are not rigid enough to reflect the sound waves properly, because when I grab the box firmly, the sound quality improves. To address this, I printed out a new resonance box with thicker walls, which made it much more rigid. With all these changes implemented, we have increased the volume of the kalimba quite a bit, but the issue still persists that the servos are very loud, and much of this sound is coming from the gearbox, so I tried adding grease to dampen it. This did help to reduce the noise, but if you're ever going to try this, definitely use less grease than what I did, because it added too much resistance and this was the new max speed. 
But just a few moments later, I discovered that plastic ear servos are actually a lot more quiet and had to repeat this process all over again. This wraps up everything I did to improve the sound quality. Now, we shift our focus to the electronics. With the finish line in sight, I hoped into CAD to improve the look. Then, I printed the parts and proceeded to final assembly. The electric kalimba is finally complete. At the front, you find the on and off switch and three buttons, each with its own purpose. The first two play preset songs. The third button plays random notes, and usually it doesn't sound great. But if you're lucky, you might just hear something that kinda resembles a melody. On the side of the device, you find the charge port. Lift it slightly and you're able to see the charging status indicated by the LEDs shining through the vent holes. I'm quite happy with how this project turned out and astonished by the precision you can achieve with these simple cheap servos. But there are definitely things that could be improved, like for example further reducing the noise from the servos. So I've uploaded all the files to GitHub. So if anyone wants to improve it, add features or just build it, all you need is there and I'd love to see what you come up with. Thanks for watching, bye!